the Fantax P400A Digital was one of the best cases we worked with last year. In fact, we gave it best overall and best airflow in our end of year case awards show. And the reason it did so well was a couple of things. One, ultra fine mesh on the front without a dust filter. Two, it had a full complement of stock fans, but did well with aftermarket ones also. And then finally, it was a price of under $100, or in theory. But that case has rarely been available now, and especially for the price it's supposed to be at, because retailers often increase it when the demand is high. Today, we're reviewing the P300A, which is a newer, technically shorter, and cheaper alternative to the P300A made by the same company. It's one we saw at CES. It's supposed to be a $60 case, and it brings the ultra-fine mesh front to the budget tier of cases as well. Before that, this video is brought to you by EVGA's RTX 2060 KO. We previously reviewed the RTX 2060 KO model for its fused down RTX 2080 die that uniquely benefited Blender and some professional applications, offering better performance than expected in some pro workloads while offering usual strong RTX 2060 performance for gaming. The RTX 2060 KO also includes the game Deliver Us the Moon for free with EVGA GeForce RTX cards. EVGA is actively restocking its RTX 2060 KO with new dies, which you can find linked in the description below. And so here it is. This is the case we showed at CES. It's not that much smaller, but the case does definitely have an important point in the market if it actually does well in today's review. One of the things we've noticed over the last couple of years is that the cases in the $60 to $70 price range have largely dried up. Part of that is tariffs, where you see companies who were unable to get exemptions from those, although why they were unable to, we're not clear on. But uh, you see companies increasing their case floor pricing by something like 15, 18%, and that's just increased the, the level at which you can actually buy a decent case. Now, another reason is because the entire industry goes in trends, and all the manufacturers of cases flocked to the trend of high-end $180 cases for a while. So this market dried up. It's coming back, though. Cases in the past we've liked in roughly this price territory would be the Silverstone Redline 06, which was something around $75, $80 originally, and that case is mostly gone at this point. So we've been waiting for good stuff to come out in the budget tier. This case only comes with one fan, unfortunately. This wasn't fully confirmed at CES, but we're going to make an argument in this review as to why budget cases specifically should include more fans than maybe even the higher-end cases. A lot of people like to say that they like to buy their own fans, and that's cool, but one, most people don't, and two, you can't beat the manufacturer pricing on fans. So for a cheaper case, it actually makes more sense economically to allow the manufacturer to bulk buy and include fans in the case, as opposed to going out and buying your own. This case, you'll end up having to not really count as a $60 option, it approaches 75 once you factor in the fan cost because they are necessary. But that's the big thing that we'll be talking about in the thermal section. Build quality, all that stuff we'll go over as well. Uh, for sizing, it's a slightly smaller version of the P400A. We've talked about this recently as well, but you're going to see cases getting shorter now that the industry has more or less moved on from old tooling that had allowances for things like five and a quarter inch drives in the front or for additional hard drives in the front of the case. So it's gotten down into the shorter tier of cases, similar to the 220T. And uh, with that all said, let's get into the build discussion written by Patrick, and then we'll talk through thermals and the conclusion. The space is tight, especially inside the power supply shroud. One way that Fantex has addressed this is by rotating the hard drive cage so that the drive sleds eject from the front of the case. This orientation is a little more convenient since the front panel is easier to remove than either of the two side panels. However, plugging cables into drives will still probably require taking the side off. The major downside is that rotating the hard drive cage leaves even less space between the cage and the power supply, so there's barely any space for the cables. The cage is removable in pieces, but not adjustable to other positions. The P300A lacks the RGB lighting effects of the P300 but it retains a single dash of white light along the power supply shroud and an RGB button control, which has been repurposed as a reset button. It's a strange sight to see a reset button replace RGB rather than the other way around. The minor lighting in the P300A isn't obtrusive, but if Fantex wanted to save a few pennies, this would have been the place to do it. We didn't even notice the light until we'd started the testing, and it led to some confusion when the not an RGB control button on the front panel did nothing to change it. 
The glass panel is a shortened design like the NZXT H500s, and we still think this is the best route for budget cases with power splice routes. Spending money on a full-sized glass panel when a quarter of it is just going to show the side of a shroud makes no sense when every penny counts and when we know the yields are going to be worse when you start drilling holes into the glass. And if you're curious about that, we have a glass factory tour for computer case manufacturing. Glass and steel panels are both held on by captive thumb screws at the back, which is a change from the earlier P300's design, which just used thumb screws through holes drilled in the glass. We prefer the P300A's design from both a functional and an aesthetic standpoint, but we'd like it even more if the glass slotted into the case along the whole bottom edge like it does on the H500. Still, points are deserved for the upgrade. The front panel design is nearly the same as in the P400A, with a super fine mesh acting both as a panel and a filter. This is the type of front panel that we most prefer. That's our bias, it's towards performance, and we've found that this one performs amongst the best. That's followed by mesh front panels with additional filters that are easily removable. The P300A's panel won't catch dust quite as effectively as a traditional filter, but it gets the job done and it allows much more air through. Check our P400A review for more thoughts on that. One intriguing difference is the use of a plastic cover at the bottom edge of the front panel, which blocks off all the mesh below the level of the power supply shroud. That may initially sound like a bad thing, but there are no fan mounts at the bottom of the front panel, and leaving an empty gap here would just allow hot air to potentially flow out of the shroud and into the intake fans. We've seen that before. We've seen limited effectiveness, too, from these sorts of tweaks, but it shows that some thought has been put into the airflow layout. We don't have a P300 non-A on hand to compare with, but we know that it has vents at the top and the bottom, so some retooling or reworking was required for this new design. The front panel is held on with the same plastic snaps that we complemented on the P400A, and that makes the front panel easy to remove for cleaning and swapping parts, and makes it a worthy investment. Mentioning the front panel means we have to revisit its single fan choice. The P300A only comes equipped with that single 120mm stock fan, installed as exhaust behind the CPU. Cutting fans is one way to bring down the cost of a case, but we believe including a full set of fans in budget cases is even more important than in the higher end ones. People think that they like to buy their own fans, and many of you might actually like doing that. However, there's one really important thing here with cheaper cases. Case manufacturers can get a better price in bulk than a customer can trying to buy individual aftermarket fans. Even if you are a fan elitist and you would actually buy a $60 case and install $20 to $40 of fans in it, most people will not and are not you. So we think that planning for most people in this instance is the better choice, especially when you're not going to beat manufacturer pricing on included fans at this price point anyway. An extra $5 to the customer is worthwhile as an investment for an extra two fans. We'll discuss this more in the thermal performance section of this review, but one fan is not enough, and that adds to the hidden cost of at least one or two more 120 mil fans to the total price. A feature we wouldn't expect at all from a $60 case is a removable top panel. It's not mentioned in the manual or the product listing at all, and it's not in any way convenient, but the entire top of the case can be lifted off independently of the top I.O. to make building easier. 15 screws hold it in place, but they're definitely screws and not rivets which would have been the cheap route. Getting the panel lined back up with all the screw holes and the top I.O. is fiddly, and we wouldn't really recommend removing the panel on a regular basis, but it makes routing the CPU power connectors and other cables at the top of the case much easier. We actually really like this feature, even if it's not marketed as one, because when you have to maintain an older system and it might involve shoving your hands into something with a bunch of sharp copper or aluminum fins, and getting diced up while trying to unplug your power supply so you can swap it because you spent $30 on a power supply and it went bad, this is going to help a lot in that instance. For a case that's intentionally as compact and cramped as possible, it's a definite value add from us. Radiator compatibility at the front of the case is claimed to be 280 millimeters with clearance up to 315 millimeters, but that's generous. 350 millimeters is the total space between the top of the power supply shroud and the bottom of the front I.O. 315 millimeters in total height is actually unusually short for a 280 mil rad, and even ones that are short will have zero wiggle room and may not line up with the mounting holes, like the Kraken X62. 
We recommend using a 240mm or smaller radiator for this case. Outside of that, mounting is fairly straightforward. The P300A is, unfortunately, one of the many cases that claims to be an EATX case without being able to fit a full 12 by 13 inch motherboard. You can watch our piece on why EATX is a fake BS made up form factor. That means nothing for more information on this, but we'll move on quickly here. The maximum supported board is 275 millimeters wide, according to the manual, but that's a stretch. We found the cable cutouts along the edge of the motherboard for the 24 pin power connector, etc., to be both narrow and at an inconvenient angle with the holes positioned so that they point back towards the edge of the motherboard. A 275 mil wide board would butt up against these cutouts and block them. It'd require an alternative cable path. This case is no good for motherboards larger than full ATX, and even for full ATX boards, we wish Fantex would make the cutouts wider so that they wrap around the corner of the cable management bar and allow for better 24 pin cable routing. Let's get into thermal testing. We stuck mostly to the usual test suite for the P300A, but we thought it deserved at least one extra test to demonstrate what performance would have been like if Fantex had included a couple of extra stock fans. We picked two Arctic Bionics F120 fans from our inventory. We installed them in the front intake slots positioned so that they wouldn't be obstructed by the fan mounts, and we carefully equalized the rotations per minute to the single stock fan, approximately 1300 RPM. The F120s top out at 1800 RPM, and they are better fans than average, but that's not the point. We're representing a cheaper fan here, if one were included. We have standardized fan testing later on with three Nocto fans, at full speed if you want an example of case performance with more expensive fans. But this one is to look at something that is functionally cheaper by reducing that RPM. Thermal testing starts with a baseline torture result for just the P300A and P400A, then we'll add the comparative tests. The P300A CPU temperature averaged 65 degrees Celsius delta T over ambient when stock. That's not quite at the point of thermal throttling down from our overclock, but it's close. Taking the front panel off lowered that to 55 degrees over ambient, but the test with no front panel still has only a single 120 mil stock fan cooling the entire case. This isn't to do with the panel being unbreathable. We've proven, and can highlight again here, that the P400A style panels are exceptionally high performing if made properly and without other blockages like filters. In this instance, it's a pressure equation. There's not much airflow in the case and it's entirely negative pressure. So removing any impedance will significantly help in a scenario in which there's no intake fan at the front. This is also why testing a case like the P400A with fan speeds that are arbitrarily too low would lack the static pressure required to overcome the mesh and thus potentially produce poor results. Removing the panel does allow more cool air to be drawn in through the case from the front, but it's not nearly as good as just adding two front intake fans, which resulted in a temperature of 47 degrees over ambient while having the front panel still in place. We normally test with no front panel as a best case possible scenario to judge the other results against and to see how much the front panel design is restricting the thermal performance of the case. With so little active cooling in the stock case, any test which adds one or more fans will have far greater effect than just taking the front panel off. For the record, this front panel design isn't restrictive at all. Just look at it. Look at the case and the B-roll. Check our P400A digital review for the comparison between front panel on versus off there which only lowered the CPU temperature by about four degrees. The P300A has a lot of potential, but you really need some fans for it. That might add to the cost if they're not lying around in your house already, but it's a worthwhile upgrade. The comparative chart is next. 65 degrees over ambient is dangerously hot for our test bench and is on the edge of thermal throttling the CPU. This is not a case that should be used with only stock cooling. The score fits on the chart between the Farah R1 and the stock PureBase 500 non-DX, which uh, isn't good. There's limited purpose to comparing temperatures this high on the chart. It's beyond the threshold of usability, and there's no gradient in our scoring between an F and an F+. They both fail. Taking the plus two fan score as an indication of what a user should be able to achieve with another maybe $15, the P300A becomes massively more competitive landing among the best results on the opposite end of the chart and even slightly outperforming the larger P400A. If MSRP were $70 with a couple extra fans or $65 with the really cheap $2 supply ones, the P300A would be highly competitive with other cases near the 47C CPU DT mark, like the Be Quiet PureBase 500DX that we recently positively reviewed or the Cooler Master H500M Mesh. GPU torture for only the Fantex cases is next. 
GPU DT was 58 degrees in the torture test, which lowered significantly down to 52 degrees Celsius delta T over ambient with the removal of the front panel. Again, to be exceptionally clear, that's not because the panel itself is bad. It's because there are not enough fans and any obstruction to the few present will be exacerbated. Removing the panel was all the help the GPU cooler needed, since testing with the added two front intake fans and the panel back on resulted in the same temperature. Remember that GPU fans can create interesting pressure dynamics involving unanticipated intake through PCIe hole punches or other small holes near the back of the case, so that's always at play too. The stock exhaust fan is nowhere near the GPU, and without additional intake fans, it's essentially sealed in its own compartment at the bottom of the case and left to stew in its own heat. If adding only one fan to the case, we recommend positioning it as an intake that will benefit the GPU. Here's the comparative chart. As with the CPU test, the GPU DT with the stock configuration is among the hottest on our chart that isn't completely out of control. Adding two fans didn't cause such a dramatic swing as it did in the CPU test, but it still ties the Purebase 500DX and is only one degree warmer, roughly with an error, than the P400A. This case has the same general design as the P400A, and it deserves the P400A digital treatment, at least, of a full stock set of fans. Just maybe kill the RGB to cut the price. The 3D Mark Firestrike Extreme stress test puts GPU DT up to 56 degrees over ambient, or about one degree lower than the torture result when decimal places are taken into account. This would be your gaming version of a test. Every slight increase in temperature means a decrease in clocks on the card to account for it, especially with temperatures this high. Adding another fan to the case will directly lead to better performance, however slight, and can aid in keeping cheaper systems alive longer where lower life capacitors are more commonly used. 56C DT is on par with the Cooler Master NR600 in this test, another budget mesh fronted case that we reviewed positively overall, but critiqued for its underperforming stock fans. Standardized fans are next. Before you read too far into this chart, please remember that standardized fan testing is inherently flawed albeit still useful, in several ways. If you don't actually know what our reasons are that it's flawed and you're just trying to guess at them, please open a new tab with the link in the description below about our standardized fan testing methodology for cases. CPU DT with a standardized set of fans was 46 degrees over ambient, close to the temperature that resulted from installing two extra fans in a similar configuration. That ties the Purebase 500DX as one of the best performing CPU results on our standardized fan chart so far, although our pool of results for this test remains far lower than the others. The P400A scored a little better at 44 degrees Celsius over ambient, but both of these are really excellent results compared to a more normal case layout with a closed front panel like the Define 7 at 56 degrees Celsius DT. Given appropriate cooling, this case can really shine. The GPU DT in this test was 49 degrees Celsius over ambient, several degrees better than the test with just two 120 mil fans added. Our standardized set of fans uses two 140 mil intakes, which cover more area and force more air under the GPU. This is again a result that's strong and in line with other mesh fronted cases, and the P300A actually outperforms the P400A by about two degrees here, outside of our error. Shortening the case slightly and not allowing any fan mounts below the power supply shroud means that two 140 mil fans take up almost the entire breathable area of the front panel, pushing a wall of air into the case. Including only one fan in the case makes the P300A relatively quiet, but thanks to some audible vibration, we measured the noise level to be 36.7 dBA at max fan speed, just slightly above the threshold for our noise normalized testing. Lowering the fan to 90% speed or approximately 1270 RPM quieted this vibration, but the thermal results were predictably terrible. We don't consider this case usable with the stock fan alone already, and lowering its speed only hurts performance. CPU temperature climbed slightly from baseline 67C, while the GPU remained at 58C DT and simply downclocked itself instead. That puts it between the two previous worst CPU DT results, the Purebase 500 non-DX and the Zonda O. It's in better company for GPU temperatures, beating at least the Fara R1, and the Define S2 Vision RGB, but it's still definitely on the warm end of the chart. As demonstrated with the P400A RGB, a case with tons of fans will still perform better thermally, even with the fan RPMs lowered to equalize the noise levels. The P400A has one of the best combined results on this chart, along with the Purebase 500DX. Like many of the budget cases we've reviewed lately then, this is in the same position where it actually has a lot of potential, 
but it performs poorly in a stock configuration, and you should not use this in a full stock configuration, especially if you're going to use something like a downdraft cooler. Even for systems that are going to be lower power consuming, like let's say you throw in a some sort of upcoming AMD Ryzen R3 CPU or an Intel i3 CPU or something, even in those instances, it's worth adding an extra fan at least. And ideally pointed sort of towards the GPU area, if not sort of somewhat split between them with a 140 mil. So it's a case that has a hell of a lot of potential. It does well once you complement it with fans. And you should basically consider the cost of the case instead of $60 to be $75. So the question becomes, is a $75 case, this one, worth it? And well, it's really not bad. Its direct competitor or direct consideration would be the Fantex P400 from the same company. It's marginally bigger, but it should be about $90 on average for the P400A digital. That's another jump in price. If you can afford it, it's good. But if you can't, that's basically where this one steps in. It's the the safety net for people who can't quite afford the P400A, but can afford a P300A with extra fans. Similar cases to this one would include the Fractal Mesh of IC, which was originally $70, the Cooler Master NR600, similar in price as well, uh, and the Farah R1 from Silverstone. And all these are cases where extra fans are recommended. So it's not like it's alone. Uh, with all that settled, though, there are two major obstacles in the P300A's way, and that's going to be availability and, again, the P400A. Availability is all over the place with Fantex cases. It's either, well, it's probably a mix of relatively high demand and not making enough. So good luck getting one. They are out of stock currently on both Amazon and Newegg when we checked filming this, but we'll link it below anyway, just in case. The P400A has been all over the place in price. Please don't pay $150 for it. Sometimes it hits that price. It's a $90 case. That's what you should pay for it. The P400A's primary advantages are just going to be the fans and uh, to some extent build quality to a minor degree, but the interior of the P400A, if you remember our review, we talked about how the case is really, it's not profound in its quality for interior. It's a bare bones, stripped down, old tooling, old chassis with just a good front on it and a good complement of fans, and that's what makes it good. It's this and the P400A, neither of them are high build quality cases. They're just kind of, they're Good cases for other reasons, but that's not it. So uh, at $60, if you're using it stock, we'd say definitely buy fans and basically consider it a bit more. In reality, the difference in height and sizing is about 1.5 centimeters shorter, top to bottom, seven centimeters shallower front to back. And um, that's pretty much all there is to talk about this one. So uh, yeah, once you add the fans in, it's good and it's competitive, but without it, don't use it that way. <laughs> So that's it for this one. Thanks for watching. Subscribe for more as always. You can go to store.gamersnexus.net if you want to support our work and get something actually useful in return, like the mod mat, which you can use for your PC builds. And they're back in stock and shipping now, by the way. Or you can go to patreon.com slash gamersnexus and subscribe for more. We'll see you all next time.